Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Backwoods Stories. We are also going to be joined today by professional voice actor Spencer Dillahay. He also has a YouTube channel where he does horror narrations. If you would like to check out his channel, his link will be in the description down below. But now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. Bonfire Party Written by Positive Fix 9434 This night started in the city, but ended in the deep woods. I wanted to put that out there, not to break any rules of the sub. This is true, and I will obscure the locations for personal safety. I apologize for the length. I'm originally from the Northeast, but couldn't stand the winters, so I went south for college. I was enrolled in my first year of university in the southern part of the U.S. The university was in a small city town, and going out to drink was the main thing everyone did. I was out with some other guys, playing pool at a small dive bar. An older guy came up, started talking to us, and asked if he could get in on a game. I'll refer to him as Brian. I was 22 then, and he looked a bit older, probably late 30s. We played a few games, and he commented about a bonfire party happening outside of town. He mentioned there were some girls he worked with hosting it, and asked if we wanted to go. My friends declined, but I was single, so I said sure. As we left the parking lot in his truck, he said we needed to swing by his apartment and grab some liquor. This is when things go weird. I remember getting in the car, pulling out of the parking lot, and then pulling up to an apartment complex on the outskirts of town. The bar was in the downtown area, and we were far away now on the outskirts of town. I wondered if I nodded off on the ride because I don't remember the drive. I started questioning myself when he said he would go inside, get the booze, take a shower, and change his clothes. He offered for me to come inside, too. The inside of his apartment was empty. No furniture, nothing is hanging on the walls, just open and empty rooms. He didn't say anything about it, so I asked if he had just moved in. He said, yeah and walked back to the bathroom without saying anything else. I thought about just leaving when I heard him get in the shower. Something about the situation was starting to creep me out. I was sizing him up in my head and thought I could take him if some weird shit went down. I remembered him mentioning the girls and the bonfire, so I decided to hang around and see where the night went. The shower stopped, and he walked out wearing different clothes a few minutes later. He had two bottles of whiskey, and he just looked at me and said, Ready? We jumped back in his truck and pulled out. I made a conscious effort to stay awake and alert. We left the city limits and headed outside town on a dark back road. We were still on a main road, but we were far from town now and the closest city I knew of was an hour away in the opposite direction. There were fewer and fewer houses as we drove, and the places I could see looked like decrepit old shacks. I'd lived here for a couple of months, but had never been out this way. We drove for a while, and I asked a few times if he knew where he was going. This was the middle of nowhere now. I didn't see any houses, and it was just thick woods on each side of the road. I didn't see him reading off of any directions or anything. 
I saw a small parking lot with a gas station and a turnoff. A lone street light lit the gas station. Only two pumps, and they looked ancient. A red neon sign said 24 hours. The building was a double-wide trailer converted into a store. We turned off onto the side street and kept driving. This road was even worse than the main road we were just on. There were no street lights, and it was very narrow. It twisted and turned, just snaking through the woods. No houses were visible, but I would see an old mailbox every once in a while. We came to the top of a hill, and there was a driveway. I asked again if he knew where he was going, and he just chuckled. I was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods with some dude I didn't know. Fear started to creep in. It wasn't at a house. It looked more like a garage or industrial building. There were no lights inside or around it. No motion lights as we drove up. No other cars or people. Where's the bonfire? I made my tone as direct as possible. He just said back through the woods. We drove past the building around the back towards the woods. As we got closer, I could see it was a small path. As we went through, branches scraped along the truck's side. After what seemed like forever, the trail opened into a clearing and I could see a few other trucks and people. Relief washed over me. I grew up in the city and wasn't used to shit like this, and I started to think I was just being uptight and needed to chill out. It was past midnight, and we left the bar around ten, so it felt good to get out of the truck. I scanned the group, but could only see a few girls... A couple of guys were building a fire and trying to get it going. There were 25 or 30 people there. A guy who was introduced as Mike walked up to us to greet Brian. But he was staring at me the whole time. He never once stopped staring at me. Brian said he needed to take a piss and walked off. And Mike asked if I wanted a beer. He said to hang tight and walked away. Mike came back and handed me an open bottle. I said thanks and started to make small talk, but he just turned and walked away. I started to look around, and something just seemed off. There was no music playing, no lights, no liveliness to the conversations. The people at this party seemed diverse in age, and I wondered how everyone knew each other. No one was talking. They were all just standing together in small groups and mumbling. Each time I approached a group of people, they would all stop talking and stare at me. It was standoffish and uncomfortable. I found myself standing alone and just looking around for Brian. I couldn't see him anywhere. I looked around for his truck but didn't see it. I had had enough of this weird shit and was ready to go. I kept scanning around, looking for his truck, but it wasn't there. I didn't hear any vehicles start up or come and go while I was walking around. I turned back towards the bonfire and saw everyone looking at me, together. All thirty or so people were now in one grouping, and they just stood there. No talking or movement. They were standing there completely still and just staring at me. The bonfire glowed behind the group, making the moment feel surreal. I stood there awkwardly and started noticing that their faces were changing. Their expressions rapidly changed from smiling to frowning to mouths and eyes wide, to snarling grimaces. But as I focused on one to see if that was what was really happening, the face would appear blank and expressionless. Suddenly, 
one of the men started walking toward me at a deliberate pace. I turned and just ran. I ran up the path out of the clearing as fast as I could. My adrenaline was surging and I kept running. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me or any vehicles, but I knew I couldn't stop and needed to put as much distance as possible between them and me. I started to panic as the trail broke off and went different ways. I didn't remember that from driving in, but I kept running. Finally, I saw the building through the trees and felt some relief. I stopped just before the edge of the trail. It was late fall and brisk, but I was burning up. I was wearing a flannel and jeans with boots. Not very good for running. I was sweating like a pig and needed to catch my breath. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me on the path or hear any vehicles in the distance. The light from the bonfire wasn't visible anymore through the thick woods. As I crossed the lot and passed the industrial building toward the paved road, lights came on inside. A second wind of adrenaline took hold, and I ran towards the paved road and kept running. My feet felt like lead and my legs burned, but I kept running as long as possible. I finally got tired and moved off the paved road into the brush to hide and catch my breath. I didn't see any headlights, so I went back to the side of the road and began jogging. I was on high alert and kept glancing behind me, but I never saw anything. I finally reached the end of the road, which connected back to the main road and the gas station. I went inside, and an old guy sat at the counter watching a small TV. He asked if I was all right, and I said I needed to use a phone. He laughed and said, where did you come from? I was out at a party and got ditched. He laughed a little and gestured toward the phone on the wall. I could see he had a gun on his hip and probably thought I was a tweaker come to rob him. There was a phone book by the phone, and I called a taxi to pick me up. An hour later, I was back in my dorm room and went to sleep. I never saw Brian again. I drove past his apartment complex, but never saw his truck parked there. I never saw it around town or back at the bar either. I remember it was an off-white single-cab Chevy, late 80s model, with a skull sticker on the back window with Roman numerals on the forehead. My curiosity got the best of me a few times, and I drove toward the small gas station. I followed the road to where the shop was and found it. I drove out a couple times, and each time there was no one there and no cars in the lot. The building looked even shittier in the daytime. I left and drove back to town. This happened in the fall of 2004, and I still get creeped out by it. This actually happened to me when I was a fair bit younger. But a while back, I was solo backpacking on an unfamiliar, but really lush, kind of twisted little backcountry trail. I was using a lot of gear that I had made from natural stuff. And it was early summer, so I didn't have any hunting licenses. And I didn't have a gun or anything with me. Literally just a short kelt that I had made and a couple of flint knives. I had a really nice couple of days of my trip. And I was encountering nothing but pleasant weather, peace and quiet, and nature in all its glory. Then, on the third day after I broke for lunch, I noticed movement on the trail behind me. I was carrying a lot of weight in a homemade triangle frame pack as a strength building exercise, and I wasn't going all that fast. I thought at first it was a hiker, 
so I made a little effort to slow down to let them pass, but they never seemed to catch up. Eventually, that started to become irritating, and that was when I started to notice the movement just off the trail behind me. It was staying behind trees and bushes and around bends, and I couldn't make out what it was. Its silhouette was indistinct, and it was staying behind cover. Couldn't get a square look at it, but the more I looked at it, the more it looked wrong. The torso was weird, too long, no waist, and I couldn't make sense of the glimpses I got of the head. The legs were extremely spinely, and the arms were hunched up or something, or tented in front of it or something. This was mostly on clay, and trails can be hard-packed ground on clay, almost drum-like. Sometimes you can really hear the thump of a footstep, but these were just erratic and so loud, like slamming a stick down onto the dirt. I called to it a few times, let it know the times for joke was over, knock it off a few times. Whenever I spoke or yelled, it would just get quiet. Every once in a while, there would be a crashing sound from back around where I heard it, and a bunch of the thumps, and I kept thinking it was charging me, but then nothing, and a while later I'd hear it again from a ways back. This lasted the rest of the day, and by the time I was breaking for camp, I was starting to be pretty freaked out and angry. It was quiet while I set up my tarp and got settled, and as dark fell, I threw some stones behind me, mostly to settle my nerves, and it was silent, so I figured whatever it was was over. When I cooked my food, I heard a few very rapid, very loud thumps from a ways behind me, and then silence. I was frozen over my dinner for a few seconds, and I could feel my heartbeat in my eyes. I looked back and put my flashlight beam through the bushes for a moment, and then, pretty high, like taller than I was expecting to look for eyes, I saw two retinas reflect back, and then a bunch of thumps and crashing, and a weird gasping, whistling breathing sound. But like it was going into a big space in a big chest, kind of high-pitched. From the distance, I heard it kind of gagging cough. I didn't get any sleep that night. I just sat with my back to a big tree and with means of defending myself into my lap. I was not feeling good in the morning, but coffee got me up and running, and I didn't see or hear any more sign of it for a few hours. I had been going west, kind of at an angle to the wind, and the trail I had to switch to started going north, and the wind on my back. This was when I started to smell something awful, and I realized that I must be smelling it because it persisted no matter how long I walked. It was rancid, rotting flesh or something equally gag-inducing, paired with a kind of musky stink. I've got a strong sense of smell, very strong, and it was making it hard to breathe. Not too long after I smelled that, I began to hear the rustling behind me again, and the weird loud faltering footsteps. I still had no idea what it was. I kept getting glimpses of it, but couldn't make out color or anything definite. Could have been gray or brown, or patches of reddish brown. Never got a clear enough look at it. I was really freaked out at this point, and I decided, stupidly, to charge at it a little, to see if it would take off. I stomped and rushed the brushes a little, and I heard the rapid thumps and crashing again, and then silence for a while. I'm not ashamed to admit that it had freaked me out for long enough and I decided that it was just time to put distance between me and it, and I took off down the trail at a fair jog, despite the weight of my pack. I got clear of the stink for a bit, and well, I had run too hard and my body decided it was a great time to vomit, so I did. I took a breather for a while, and then started to really drag to my next watering spot, a little brook, and it was no fun at all. It took me most of the day to get there, and I ended up skipping lunch because I didn't want to stop, I ended up deciding to set up camp closer to the water than I usually do. I was determined to get some sleep, but still freaked out, so I decided to do something I wouldn't normally do, and I set my hammock up really, really high, like around four to five feet off the ground, with my feet a little lower than my body, so I could roll out and land on them. I ate my food as quickly as I could, and then climbed best as I could into my hammock, and tried to be as still as I could. I started to doze off almost immediately. An important detail is that I keep my pack on another tree with my poncho over it and my bear locker and a food bag even further away hanging in a tree. 
It had been drizzling for a few hours at that point. I don't know how long I slept before I was woken up by this bizarre plasticky drumming sound. Really, really loud. Paired with the bizarre thumping and weird breathing, and the stench was back big time. It took me a moment to come to, and then I was in full fight or flight. The noise was so weird. I had one of those little inflatable lanterns hanging off my hammock, so I flicked it on, and I could kind of vaguely see around me, the bushes and stuff. As soon as the light went on, the noises all stopped. Silence. Long enough for crickets to start up their BS again. Then rapid steps and the thing popped through the foliage into the little area I had set up my tarp and hammock. And I could see it more clearly for the first time. It was long torsoed and thin-legged and moved lurchingly. Weird, too big head apparently pierced through with a branch or something and lolling. Arms apparently outstretched in front of it and I could see its eyes reflecting back at me, greenish-yellow. I got that much of a glance, and dropped down to the ground in my bare feet with my hatchet in hand. When I looked back up, I finally recognized it. It was a mule deer buck, covered in sores and dirt, and skeletally thin, stumbling around on its hind legs, and going from tree to tree snapping at leaves, or something that weren't there. Its breathing was super ragged and weird, and its head was very flopped on its neck. And as it got closer to me, it fell down, making the crashing sound that it had made before, and then struggled back up. When it noticed me, it froze, pissed a bunch, and then took off into the bushes. I would have laughed if I hadn't been so relieved and tired. I went to inspect my food bag, and it looked like I hadn't tied it well enough. As it was down, leaning against the trunk of the tree, and it had the ever-loving crap kicked out of it. There were bent and scuffed bits all over my bear locker. I figured it must have been CWD or something, but man did that mess with me. I marked a few spots with bricks pushed into the mud so I could find the tracks in the morning, dried off and slept for a few hours. I ended up searching around the place for a while in the morning, and it had already been muddy as I was putting up my shelter. Here's the thing. I found deer prints from where it had come in and left, but outside my clearing from the direction I had heard it coming, I only found one print, a lot smaller than my feet. I'm size 11 and flat-footed, with a high arch and only three toes, and it was in deep, deeper than my prints. No other tracks that I could find. I caught the rotting meat smell a few more times on the way back. I was supposed to go two days further in and then turn around and I decided to just head back to my car. I actually heard the thumping as I was getting back to where I parked, and ended up hustling the rest of the way. I haven't hiked on that trail since, if I'm being honest. There were some other weird aspects of it that I don't know if I want to get into, but I'll answer questions or whatever. Also, I called this my number three scary story. Some of y'all asked for my one and two. It's a big ask. I'm not sure I want to revisit it at all. But I did write down my number two scary story. This is the number two scary story shared by the same person. I had a self-rescue I had to do in the Laramie Peak region. I lost my gear and map and shelter in a windstorm. Took a few days to get out. Had some deeply unpleasant experiences along the way. This isn't that story. It sucked, but it's not all that scary. I kept a cool head. Typically, that's who I am. I'm the person who stays calm in crisis. And I mention that to give you a litmus test for what it takes to freak me out to make me lose my cool. This is about a time when I had all my gear, but I couldn't keep my cool. There are a lot of cool trails in Colorado, some well known, some only locals know. There are mountains and forests for days out there. In 2013, we got torrential downpours in September along the Eastern Slope. It was squelchy as crap for a while, and then a glorious mushrooming boom happened. I love mushrooms. I love to forage, take one, leave three, and my absolute favorite 
is the Belitis rubriceps. The conditions weren't exactly right, but I thought, why not? I gave it a shot. I'm not saying where my spot is. Wild horses couldn't, etc., etc. I will say I also have the native hazel there. Some actually fruiting manzanita, watermelon berry, currants, rose ships, raspberries, strawberries, and a frequently oysters, morels, hawks wings, puffballs, the big ones in one meadow, milky caps, chicken of the woods and chicken of the road, and the only chanterelles I've ever found in Oregon, all in a glorious few acres. It's wonderful. I can disperse camp there. This is where I went. No brainer. Now it's fall, even if it's somewhat early fall. So I know that Yogi and Boo Boo are going to be out stuffing it out for the winter. So I've got my spray and my uncle's lever action 44 Mag Henry. Girlfriend at the time was supposed to come with me but couldn't get off work. So solo it was. I figured I could practice some firecraft, maybe build a chair, maybe a smoker, and in general just have a nice few days out. I went up early in the morning, hiked about seven miles in, set up my shelter, set up to enjoy the rare luxury of a real fire in Colorado later, and started to do my stuff. Set up a couple rods with bells, got out my baskets, and set up my dryer and its shelter far away from my sleeping tarp shelter. I was squelching around with my foraging gear out in a few minutes, and having a blast. I marched happily along pretty much until dusk, and then pulled out my headlamp and kept going well past I should have. But damn did I get a haul. It was an incredible spread, and I left plenty for the woodland critters. I got back to my camp, started cleaning and drying, and probably didn't get to my dinner until one in the morning. I had caught two brook trout of reasonable size, gutted them, and let them hang in a bug net next to the creek for the day. Figured it was cold enough that they'd be okay. I got back to my little dinky tarp shelter around 3 a.m. and went inside, toweled off and passed out. I awoke around 10 a.m. or so the next day and the woods were silent. I mean, no birds, no bugs, wind in the branches, nearby brook gurgling, and that's it. Usually there's something. I decided to be cautious and go about my business. My camp was exactly as I had left it, except for two things. The first was there was a branch about two feet long, thick as a wrist, laid against the tree my pack was tied to. It had been gnawed, like by a beaver on both ends, which I've heard of but have never seen before or since. It had no bark on it, but still was green wood. Had to have been left there, but to what end I have no idea. Unsettling? Sure. Freaky? Not really. I wasn't scared. Actually, my first thought was I must have picked it up and forgotten about it, and I put it out of my mind and went to collect my fish, which hopefully were still there and weren't rotten or nasty yet. I got into sight of them, or rather, the bug net that they were in. They were gone. Bug net was loose but intact. It's the drawstring bag-shaped kind, and empty. And both fish heads were still hanging in there, but the rest of the fish were gone. Okay, probably another person then. Someone is giving me the Scooby-Doo treatment. I had a bunch of charcoal from the fire, and there was a nice big rock next to my fishing spot, so I scrawled on there. If you're hungry, come say hi and I'll share my meal, with an arrow pointing roughly towards my camp. Grumpy more than unsettled now, I guess weird beaver branch is a trade for my fish. Whatever. I went to check on my drying shrooms and my berry cooler, and lo and behold, everything under the tarp is untouched. However, I hadn't swept out any of the debris beneath it. Why bother? Well, now there was no debris beneath my tarp, just straight dirt and rocks. Weird again. I started looking more seriously for tracks and find nothing. Probably debris swept out from under my shelter was covering them. F it. I'm not here to play junior detective. I'm here to frolic in the woodlands and collect responsible amounts of treasured forgeables. I shake it off, go back to the creek to set my lines again, and notice my bells are gone. Okay. I couldn't remember if they had been there that morning or not, so I assumed they were taken the previous night. I had only tied the rods to the tree after all, 
It was easy grabbing. I went back to my tarp, made some food and coffee, shook it off and went about my business. Now here's the somewhat embarrassing thing. I know to make noise in the woods if bears can be around, and I like to sing. This isn't the same as singing well or singing manly shantings and Viking epic poems. This is, by and large, singing whatever had been playing on the speakers at my job. So, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Florence and the Machine, Lord, you get the picture. Also, I'm a bass. Whatever, don't judge me. Stuff is designed to be catchy. So I went back on my rounds, and I found some monster morels or ash morels, which are a really rare treat. I was also really excited. There are hundreds of them, and it's super late for them to show up. They're my favorite morels. I set about to collecting some, and kept myself company by singing. All right, I was singing Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. I know. I got to the whoa, oh, oh, oh part, if you've heard it and you know it. When I heard what sounded like someone harmonizing, like I said, I'm a bass, but this was higher, tenor or alto, and muted by distance a little. It was also completely and undeniably wrong, scratchy, gravelly, almost buzzy, syllables weird and clipped and disjointed, and a little off key and off rhythm, uncanny valley for sounds. I shut up immediately and froze, and it continued for a moment, and then stopped. I was experiencing a little more of what my friends always call a pucker butt, and started to slowly reach back behind for my Henry on its strap, and I heard a single sudden yelp or bark or something, and some rustling from somewhere uphill of me, behind the tree line. I take a few breaths, assuming I had freaked the other party out just as much as they did me, and forced myself to relax. I keep small binos on me and I scanned the tree line, but I didn't see anything. I thought, this is probably whoever took my fish. Probably someone squatting out here. I'm gonna keep my head on a swivel some, but if they were gonna be a problem, I feel like they already would have confronted me or taken a pot shot or something. It also occurred to me, finally, that I could have just been hearing some weird echo. That thought gave me a little more peace and calm than I had a few minutes before. Although it didn't explain the yelp, but normal activity does. Hooray rationalizing. I decide that is enough morels, and I do not want to be drying them after dark, so I head back to camp and get to making that happen. Am I an idiot? Maybe. I really didn't want to go home. I love wet weather. I've grown up in high deserts my whole life, and getting to really see some green that late in the year is such a treat. I wanted to stay, Creepy stuff be damned. I had had moments where my brain had tricked me before and talked myself into believing that it was happening again. I kept singing to myself, more quietly than I was before. Sea is titanium, and it happens again. The weird, buzzy, higher voice joins in, again from a distance, and again I feel the bottom drop out of my stomach. I know this probably just sounds creepy because I thought I was alone, but it's hard to convey how off-sounding this was. It was fairly close to what I had been singing, but like it was coming up out a culvert or something, and a few octaves higher, just as buzzy and clicky and hoarse sounding. If you've ever heard a tornado, or a parrot talking, or squeaking brakes, or a train whistle, you'll get a sense of the qualities this voice had. It's a pitch human can emulate with their throat, but the texture and shape of the sound aren't really how we sound. I was not having it at all. I shut up immediately again, and this time got the Henry off my back and looked around me. I figured this had to be somebody messing with me, not unheard of for good foraging spots. Look up the flights over huckleberry patches if you don't believe me, but definitely my first time. Again, the singing continued for a moment after I stopped, again from uphill and further into the woods and definitely in a direction that I hadn't gone yet. I called out, announced myself and asked them to answer please. Nothing. I tried again. Nothing. Silence again. And since I'm listening, I notice it again. Just wind in the trees in the creek. No animal noises. No bugs. My head had felt a little squeezy, so I decided I needed to check the weather when I was sure I wasn't going to get shot or something. Maybe a storm was rolling in. Bingo. 
I had headed over to a clearing and for sure a storm was rolling in. As always hard to judge speed, but it wasn't a bad idea to see about reconfiguring my tarp and having an early bedtime. Again, a little more at peace, since I figure any more BS from my apparent neighbor is going to be less likely. I went back to my fishing rods, lucked out and found I had caught a bigger trout than the night before. I gutted it, cooked it, and ate it on the spot. Those of you in the know know it's hard to beat. I collected some water for the next day, packed up my foraging stuff, and lashed it all to trunk, and decided to call it there before dusk was on its way in. I set up my tarp in a lower to the ground, more wind resistant configuration, and set up a spare older one as a kind of rain fly over the entrance. It's worth noting that this was an old lightweight silver collared nylon backpacking tarp. Fairly thin setup facing the clearing, since likely the worst wind would be coming from there. It's also pretty much blocked my view of the clearing. I did another Widowmaker check. All good. Made a hot cocoa and tucked in, just as it was starting to come down. It came down hard. I had put in some earplugs. Lightning was frequent and loud, and I didn't stay particularly dry and didn't get much sleep. It was, all in all, one of the most unpleasant and awe-inspiring nights I had had camping. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I thought I heard slash felt something bounce off my tarp, kind of behind me. Well, not that weird. It happens in storms. I figured it was a branch. Then a few minutes later, I see something. Maybe a stone, about the size of a plum, bounce off of my tarp, off the rain fly, and land in front of me. I get my headlamp turned on, and sure as crap, it's a rock. Round, but not symmetrical or spherical, and smooth. A river rock. Rocks don't fall off of trees as a rule, and if this storm had picked one, this round up, I should have been airborne. Then another one a few minutes later. Similar trajectory. Then nothing but the storm for a while. What am I going to do? Investigate and get soaked? I had my gun, and if stuff was going to go down, I was about as ready as I could be. I turned my headlamp back off. I then got treated to pretty much the most awe-inspiring amount of lightning I have ever seen in my life. The sky lit up for seconds at a time. The earplugs were not protecting me from the thunder, and my ears are ringing. I keep seeing the trees from the edge of the tree line, and the clearing projected, in shadow form, onto my rain fly over and over again, dancing this way and that. It was really beautiful, and, if kind of inherently scary, also exhilarating. I really couldn't look away. Then, pretty clearly, I saw what looked like a person walking along the tree line, outlined against the trees and my rain fly by the lightning. They were walking weirdly, not running from cover to cover, but just kind of strolling a little unsteadily, like a drunk person. The silhouette wasn't bulky, and for some reason I got the impression they weren't wearing clothes, or if they were, they were very, very tight, not like rain gear. They stopped, and whether or not they were facing me or the clearing, I couldn't tell you, but I felt watched and very exposed. The figure stood, swaying a little, probably being pushed around by the winds, and just looked at whatever they were looking at. I got little glimpses here and there as the lightning flashed, but they didn't appear to be moving much. It was pretty freaky, and I didn't move except to get my gun in front of me. Then I had another rock land on my tarp, bounce off and land in front of me. That was a bad moment. Lightning had stopped for a bit, and the thunder had died down for a moment. I had horrible, slow realization that I was very likely surrounded. Then I heard, cutting through the ringing in my ears and momentarily silence. Clear as it had been earlier but sounding much closer, the chorus from Titanium from beneath my tarp. If you don't know the words, here they are. I'm bulletproof. Nothing to lose. Fire away. Fire away. Ricochet. You take your aim. Fire away, fire away. Then nothing. I looked back towards the front and realized I didn't see that figure projected by the lightning anymore. Now that there was a lull in the lightning, I remember thinking crap, crap, crap just over and over again. I basically was going to have to crawl out of my tarp and get on my feet, and there was pretty much no way I was going to stay in my shelter anymore. I counted down from ten, 
and then pushed myself out and got to my feet, Henry in hand, and let out the loudest yell I could. I think I said something like, knock it off, I'm armed, F off. I was not in a good headspace. I was about as freaked out as I had ever been up to this point. And this was not all that long after the deer thing I mentioned in my previous post. I was about ready to crap myself. I looked around the back of my tent with my light and didn't see anything. Nobody. Just rain pouring down. I walked around the front of my tarp. Nobody. I could clearly see into the clearing until my light got shallowed up by the rain. I walked around the edge of my little camp, sticking close to my tarps, and I didn't see anybody. I wish I could say I checked out the tree line for footsteps, but I didn't. I tried to yell again and my voice was completely in my throat. Another rock hit my shelter and bounced off, squarely in the cone of my headlamp. And I won't lie to you all, I lost it. I fired my Henry into the dirt about 10 feet in front of me, and I heard some immediate rustling in the woods uphill from me again. I yelled some dumb panicked BS and thought F me if I know why. I ducked into my tarp again, wrapped up as much as I could and huddled up with my gun. Eventually the storm broke, followed by dawn, and I got up to pack up my stuff and get out of there. I was pretty shaky and it took me a while to get my various gear all in hand and brought up to my shelter. I took a few moments to gather up the round river stones and I noted I didn't see any like this even in the creek and definitely none setting around the ground. The debris is too thick. My shelter was the farthest thing back in the woods of the various stations around the camp, except for my pack, which had a garbage bag over it. When I rent around the back of the tarp to grab it, there were two more little sections of sapling green wood, chewed looking ends. Bark stripped again, just like before leaning against the trunk below it. Nope, not okay. It took me a second to go get my pack. I was that freaked out that I was now afraid of sticks. One my first night and two the second. Nope, F that. I finally got myself under control and went to grab my pack. And again, I had a powerful sense of being watched. I shook off the cover, packed it in a dry bag and turned around to get my stakes out of the ground and pick up my tarp. There was a hole, very obviously dead rabbit on the back edge of my tarp. The rain had washed off any leakage that would have been on it but the carcass was just splayed out there, like it had landed on it after being thrown and then slid down the slope of it. It was fresh enough it didn't stink. I won't paint you a picture. I was instantly and totally numb. Mental dial tone. I picked it up with a stick, dropped it on my swamped out fire pit, yanked my tarp out of the ground one stake at a time, balled it up, yanked my rain fly out of its lashings hard enough to rip it, Grabbed the rest of my stuff, loosely shoved it all in my pack, put my Henry so it hung in front of me, and power walked slash jogged my way out of there until I couldn't anymore, and breathlessly walked the rest of the way to my car. I got in, drove about 20 minutes, and then had to pull over to throw up a few times and have a panic attack. I have never been back there alone, and definitely not unarmed. Even then, I only went back in 2017. I still can't listen to that song without feeling sick. I know, rationally, that it was probably squatters or something up there messing with me. But the same question keeps coming up. Why didn't they need lights? My grandma used to take me camping when I was a child, and I did a girls camp in the summer in the mountains when I was a preteen, where my friends and I would often wander off into the woods together. As a child, I played in the woods for hours with my brother. It was always fun and always felt safe, and never eerie or creepy. Most of my time in the woods as a child and a teen was joyful, fun, and adventurous. I'd like to share another experience where a friend and I had a bad feeling. Others dismissed us and there ended up being a reason why. When we were in our 20s, a friend of mine in DC organized a women's survivalist training camp for a group of our female friends. Maybe seven to eight of us, I can't remember. I had never been to West Virginia, 
but the land was beautiful and the roads were terrible. We had rented a cabin at a campground with multiple cabins on site. And during the day, our guide and teacher would take us out to teach us cool things like local medicinal plants or how to make a rope out of milkweed. A West Virginian extended family was having a large family reunion at the time and two to three of their girls about elementary school age started hovering around our classes to be around the big girls, I assume. So cute. And they already knew most of what we were learning. We had a great time in the woods and on the land with no creepiness the first night. On the last night, the owner of the campground had a big bonfire with hot dogs and marshmallows to roast and cider. And everyone who was renting a cabin was invited. It was after dark and it was either a longish walk or a short drive, but on the campground land. So my friend, A and I decided to walk. We were having a nice walk and a nice chat when suddenly we got a bad feeling and we both went quiet at the same time. We acted nonchalant, but glanced around to see what we could see. On our right was a cabin that looked deserted. It was totally dark, no lights on, no lantern out, but there was a single spot of light, the red embers of a cigarette burning. We could barely make out the figure of a man sitting there in the dark smoking. We stayed quiet, but picked up the pace. We checked in with each other once we approached the big house and were finally in the light of the bonfire. Was that creepy to you? Yes, that was creepy to us. Had we felt creepy before out here? No, we had felt calm and safe. The land hadn't ever felt creepy to us before, but the guy sitting in the dark had given off a terrible menacing vibe even 20 feet away before we even saw him. We told some of our friends and they just laughed it off and told us that we had been afraid for no reason. It was perfectly safe here, they said. He was just another camper, probably with that West Virginian family. We were just paranoid, they said. Other than that, we had a great time at the bonfire, chatting with other campers and with the owners, who were very, very nice. When it came time to call it a night, the owner offered to drive us back, and A and I happily agreed, wanting to avoid another walk by that terrible cabin. We got back safely, without incident, and the owners wished us good night. Now our cabin had two levels, the ground floor and a loft level. The ground floor was one big open room with a few small beds, and if I recall correctly, a table and chairs, and a fridge and maybe a stove. I was on the ground floor with about three other girls, and A was on the loft level with two to three other girls. I often have insomnia, and I did that night, so I just stayed awake in the dark while everyone else fell asleep around me. I was awake for hours just thinking my thoughts until I heard the crunch of gravel outside, like someone walking on it. I nudged my friend V, who was the closest person to me. V, there's someone outside. V mumbled and told me it was just a deer and to go back to sleep. Okay, V was of no help. I got out of bed and crawled over to the window to see if I could hear a deer outside, crunching on the gravel. I saw instead the red glow of a cigarette and could faintly make out the silhouettes of two men in the darkness. Now, the cabins were not close together. They weren't far, but they weren't close. We were on a bend of the camp road where there weren't any other cabins. The closest one was a short walk away, but it wasn't like running across the street or next door or anything, and not visible behind trees and brush. Anyway, the closest cabin was far enough away that there was no reason for two guys to be smoking about a hundred feet behind our cabin in the dark. I nudged V again. V, there are two guys out there. Shut up. It's a deer, go to sleep. Now, my boyfriend at the time had basically bought me all of REI to go on this trip. Our guide had asked us to bring a large knife and he had bought me a large hunting knife, but also a little camp hatchet. I didn't know what I thought I'd be able to do with these, but I grabbed both and just huddled under the window in the dark, waiting. Suddenly a car alarm went off. All the cars were parked in front of the house groans came from the other girls shut your effing car alarm off whose car is that it's not mine a said i think it's mine found the key fob and turned off the alarm silence i sat in the dark and waited her car alarm went off again the other girls lost it hey shut off your effing car alarm i'm trying she finally got it to shut off again i crawled over to v 
V, there are guys out there, and I think they're messing with A's car. Shut up. It's just a deer. Go to bed and leave me alone. Okay, then. The car alarm went off again. A, shut off your car alarm. The other girls groaned. She did. The car alarm went off again. A, what is wrong with your alarm? Go out and fix it. She turned it off. I'll go out there, but will someone go with me? I will, I said, and I'm turning the lantern on, so FYI. A came down the ladder. I went up to her and whispered, A, there are two men out there, and no one will believe me. They keep saying it's just a deer, but I saw them smoking in the back. You can't go out there alone. I'm going out first with the lantern, so at least we can see around the cabin. We put our shoes on, and I turned the lantern on, and opened the door and walked onto the porch. Lantern in my left hand, hatchet in my right. I hung the lantern up on a little hook on the porch. It was very bright, and lit up the whole clearing in front of the cabin, and the whole little parking lot for the cars, for the moment at least, and walked around her locked car, trying the handles. No alarm went off as she tugged each one. She came back up the steps. Nothing. See, it wasn't a deer, I said. Even with you trying to get into your own car while it was locked, no alarm. Your alarm is not that sensitive. Someone was trying to break in. We went back into the house, locked the door behind us, turned off the lantern, and sat inside the dark waiting for our eyes to adjust. A told me she hadn't been able to sleep as well, and had been laying awake in the dark up in the loft, feeling uneasy before the first alarm went off. I told her I wondered if someone had tried to lure her out there alone in the dark and had been spooked off when two of us came with both an extremely bright lantern and a hatchet. We stayed together quietly chatting in the dark for hours, waiting to see if anything else would happen again. The car alarm did not go off again. Finally, enough time had passed that we decided to go into bed. The car alarm was quiet for the rest of the night. That was our last night there. So in the morning, we packed up and I drove back with A. If a zombie apocalypse were to ever happen, I'd pick A for my team because she listened to her gut feeling and worked with me as a team to keep each other safe. I write this to encourage people to listen to their gut feelings out in the woods. It could keep you safe. In 2020, my mom, female in her 60s, and I, a female in my 30s, decided to go on an overnight camping trip together on the Oregon coast. I picked a what looked like a pretty campsite from a campsite app, and off we went. When we got there, we realized it was right off the highway, but there were enough trees and a fence up front that you couldn't really see the road, but the gate was just a metal gate that swung into place, no locks. There was a house on either side, but the property was fenced in on both sides. We pitched the tent pretty far back close to the woods on the back of the property. The closest house was about 100 yards away, and the highway was about 200 yards. But again, it was all mostly fenced in and surrounded by tall firs. It was a lovely sight, and my mom raved about how beautiful and peaceful it was. I will say that I got a feeling of dread as soon as we walked onto the property. But we arrived late and I didn't know if we'd be able to get a new spot quickly. My mom could tell I was nervous, but for some reason I put her enjoyment of the beauty of the campsite over my feeling of dread. We made a nice campfire and enjoyed some hot chocolate as we watched the fire. I kept an eye out and didn't see or hear anything odd. If I remember correctly, my mom went to bed before I did, and I stayed up and watched the fire for a long time before going to bed. Finally, I tucked in, very exhausted from staying up. At about 2 a.m., I awoke to twigs snapping and what sounded like someone dragging their fingers on the side of the tent, up to the front. I sat up and grabbed my phone and the only weapon I had, a large flashlight, and unzipped my sleeping bag in case I needed to fight anyone. There was a full moon that night and I couldn't tell if it was a person's shadow falling on the tent or if it was a tree branch shadow moving from the wind. It sounded like there were two people outside trying to be quiet. 
We had brought our boots inside, so there was no indicator outside of who was in that tent. It felt like they were trying to gauge the tent while I was listening for where they were. I had made sure to make enough noise so they knew someone inside was alert, but no more than that. If they know someone is awake, they can't surprise us, but they also don't know who is inside and whether or not we have guns. I sat there in the dark until dawn. My mom slept through the whole thing. When we got up and out of the tent, small things had been moved. Our camp chairs had cup holders. One cup that had been inside a cup holder was on the ground. A pen that had been in a cup holder was also on the ground. My mom raves about how good her sleep was and how refreshing it was to camp there. So I didn't want to burst her bubble or scare her. We packed up and I didn't tell her, but let her have a nice memory of deep rest and relaxation while camping on this beautiful property. Was it someone living in the woods? Someone walking down the highway in the middle of the night? Creepy neighbors? Who knows? My mom got a great experience and I got a refund and a fear of camping. The property owner said they might set up cameras to keep an eye on things in the future. People scare more than almost anything else that could be out there. Anyway, listen to your gut. We should have found another campsite, or at least a hotel. I work as a child care professional, and one of the kids that I look after had recently gotten into hiking. I decided to take him to a really cool trail in Salt Fork State Park. We were all set to hike Hozak's Cave after parking right near the beginning of the trailhead. The entire trail is about half of a mile, which is why I chose this trail for our hike that day. I also chose this trail because any time that I had been on it before, it was very busy and full of people in a very popular spot which made me feel secure. However, this past summer we had a cluster of several summer storms which caused massive damage to the trail. So, to my surprise, it was much more difficult and completely empty. I wasn't bothered by the trail being obviously empty because there was a small construction crew working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot wide with a six to 12 foot drop off into a creek bed that is solid rock and several trees down. He's very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was, and he was so excited to tackle our adventure. We made it all the way to a platform that allows you to see the entire cave. There were many downed trees surrounding the platform and it was actually closed at this point, but we had made it this far. So we decided to maneuver around the platform and proceed the few hundred feet into the cave. We spent the most time in this area due to the difficulty, but I know exactly what it looked like. There were tree roots directly under the platform and you could climb down either side of them. It's also worth noting that Hozak's cave is much more like a cliff with an overhang rock formation and a trickle of a waterfall directly in the middle. It's not a creepy closed up cave. It is very open and very beautiful. We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently, but had been at some point, sitting on a large rock that had a heart carved into it. I chalked it up to someone having a date or something and disregarding it. We wanted to climb to the top, where I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that had been snacked up by somebody. I definitely felt weird at this point, but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. It was the happiest that I had seen him in a very long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was time to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. We finally decided to leave, and when we got to the platform, dead center in the middle of the tree roots was a wet washcloth hanging that was absolutely not there before. He noticed it as well, but did not pick up on the severity of the situation that we were in. At that moment, I factually knew two things. One, someone was watching us and we did not see them. And two, they were now potentially hiding in the woods and made it a point to not be seen, but to leave an object to be noticed. There was no running back with the narrow trail and I was not about to tell him that we were in potential danger. 
I told him to go in front of me. And I just kept encouraging him that he was doing great over and over. And that seemed to speed him up naturally. I never saw anyone while we were on the trail. We got to the car and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a very dirty man, probably in his 30s, came out of the woods and made it a point to stare at me with the most empty of expressions that I have ever seen. The man followed me with his eyes and head as I drove by him and continued to stare at me until I couldn't see him anymore. I knew the third fact at that point. He made it a point to make himself apparent to me, and the facts one and two were true. That stare stuck with me for days, and I considered counseling after this, as it bothered me for several weeks, causing me severe anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time, and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, the crazy-looking man had ample time to do anything that he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I just cannot in any way rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way that he did if he wanted to go unnoticed. Deep down, I know that it is much more likely that it was a deliberate action intended to scare me. He never had any idea how panicked I was, and to this day, it is the most fun that I have ever seen him have. He brings it up regularly, and it was a very positive experience for him. It was one of my worst experiences ever, and it made me feel so sick and disturbed. I was in my last year before retiring from the army and was going through a divorce. My soon-to-be ex went back to Texas with my two girls, and I planned to move closer to them once my retirement was official. I rented a small two-bedroom in Tennessee in a town called Indian Mound. Indian Mound was out of the way and really isolated. My commute sucked, but it was cheap and peaceful. I had no neighbors. Across the street was all conservation land for miles. On one side and around the back of the property was a swamp. On the opposite side, the closest house was out of shouting distance. I enjoyed living there initially. Before this, I lived in the suburbs, and all the noise, people, and traffic drove me crazy. One night I came home, around one in the morning from a concert in Nashville. It was early spring, and it was somewhat foggy out. The driveway dipped down, and the house was about an eighth mile from the road. As I pulled in, I saw a huge black dog standing in the front yard. Looked like a black lab or lab mix breed. It stood with its head up and its tail straight up. It was fixated on me. I slowly pulled my car up, unsure what to do next, when it turned and ran into the swamp. I didn't think much of it and went inside. Over the following few months, things started happening at night. I would always wake up around three or so in the morning, thinking I heard voices outside my window and sometimes it sounded like someone or a couple of people were whispering to each other, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. Sometimes I would hear footsteps and movement outside. I thought it was maybe a deer or that dog, but when I looked out, I saw nothing. This type of stuff continued for months. One night, I woke up to a noise and saw it was 2.57. A bright white light shone through the porch glass doors. I ran into the kitchen and looked through the small sink window, and it looked like someone was out in the swamp shining a spotlight. It was one of those high-powered lights used in search and rescue. It was blinding and lit up the whole kitchen. I opened the back doors and ran out onto the porch, yelling that I was calling the cops. The light went out, and I heard someone moving away from the house through the swamp. Cops came out and took a report and told me to ensure my doors were locked and to call if anything else happened. I was hyper vigilant for the next few days. I checked behind me when I was coming and going and always slept with the shades drawn and doors locked. The footsteps around the house continued and some nights I thought I could hear a dog panting outside my window. Although I never found tracks or saw signs of an animal in the morning. Things died down for a while and I was about three months away from the end of my lease. I woke up around three in the morning, scared out of my mind. I was sleeping and heard a woman calling my name in my dream. I opened my eyes and realized it was a dream when I heard the voice call my name again, clear as day. 
I shot up out of bed and turned on the lights. I checked in the closet and under the bed. I opened the bedroom door and listened out in the hallway. I couldn't hear anything and was about to cut the lights and go back to bed when someone started pounding on my front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was like someone was bashing the door with a sledgehammer. I yelled out that I had a gun and to get the F off my property. I said I called the cops and I'll blow their effing head off if they get here. The pounding stopped. Cops came out again and took another report. There was no visible damage to the door or footprints around the property. It all just stopped after that. I did buy a 9mm, but the rest of my time renting there was without incident. I'm back in Texas, in an apartment complex in the suburbs, and I don't mind. The backwoods of Tennessee were a creepy place. I live on a farm on the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere in British Columbia's interior. No cell service. Neighbors are beyond shouting distance. A very on-your-own lifestyle out here. My trailer is at the top of this property next to a barn, surrounded 360 degrees with forest, except for the little road up here. The mountain, Mount Ida, has a long history with the aboriginal people of my area. I've been told stories of the mountain since I was a kid. Basically, the summary of every story is people are banished from the mountain because the spirits make it too dangerous. All sorts of weird things have been seen and have happened on this mountain. Last night around 10.45 p.m., I heard three sets of sirens rush by the road. Out here, you never hear sirens. In my accumulative 15 years here, I've heard one siren, and it was earlier this week. Basically, it just intrigued me at that point. Wasn't until about half an hour later or so, and my powers cut out. I'm already in bed by this point. Lights were out. Only way I actually noticed was because I had no Wi-Fi. Now that's always a heart stopper. Because out here, no Wi-Fi means I'm entirely on my own. This makes me anxious for sure. But I'm more worried that I won't be able to call the fire department if something catches on fire than anything. Then out of nowhere, I hear this super sharp and loud cry like a kid who just crashed on a bike, hysterically crying from what sounds to be a young child. My dogs are going absolutely nuts at the door. Now, if you're familiar with cougars slash mountain lions, you should know that they can often mimic a child crying and scary accurately too. So laying there as the tension builds, I'm just telling myself it's a cougar. That's all it is, just a cougar. For me, that's the best case scenario right now, that it's just a cougar. Dogs have finally calmed down and I'm still just trying to get some shut-eye when I hear the second sound. This was an ungodly sound that I've never heard in my life. This one sounded like a mix of every horror movie monster all in one. I can't even describe it. It was about five seconds of pure screeching, like a demonic banshee with the vocal cords of a T-Rex. The bass to it shook my bed. It was as if there was a concert-sized sound system hiding in the forest blasting zombie vomit. I could taste my heartbeat at this point. My dogs are acting like rabies-ridden pit bulls towards the door, snarling and growling like whatever just screamed was on the other side of the door. I didn't know what to do at that point. Couldn't call or get in contact with anyone. Lights are all off. I'm just laying there in the dark, utterly and completely scared. I was not about to get up and go investigate. It's the middle of winter, of course, too. I just laid there checking my phone every 30 seconds seeing if the Wi-Fi came back. Nothing else came after, though. Just ended up falling asleep at some point. As of this morning, everything is back to normal. Nothing creepy going on. Power's back on. Made a post in the local Facebook group. Nobody else in the area heard anything, and only a few lost power as well as me. So take it as you will. Cougar and heat... Bigfoot coming out of hibernation. Thousand-year-old native ghost trying to get me off his land. I'm not a very paranormal guy, and I have no idea what it could have been at this point. Would love to hear your thoughts, ideas, or questions. Update. Time to update and answer a few questions and ideas from everyone. So to start, 
It has been confirmed the sirens and the power was lost due to a motor vehicle incident into a power pole a kilometer or so down the road. Strangely enough, I have also found out that other siren a week or so ago was also responding to an MVI, but in almost the exact same spot, so take that as you will. I also decided to open Reddit for the first time to see all the comments at about 1 in the morning. Terrible idea. You guys have all scared the crap out of me even more, but thank you as well. General update. Yes, to everyone mentioning it, I do have a generator. Problem is, it's up in the barn, along with the Wi-Fi router. Definitely was not going to even open my bedroom door, let alone go outside after hearing that and go into the dark and creepy barn to screw around with the generator. I have checked around the walkable vicinity. No tracks or anything of interest that I found, although I did not want to go searching through the forest for tracks, to be completely honest. As for gun protection, I would absolutely love to have a gun for this exact reason, but it's a hassle in Canada. And even if I did decide tomorrow was the day, it's a long process, and I probably wouldn't have a gun till next winter, so that won't help me now. Cougar? As I said, the first one was definitely a cougar in my opinion. I have heard many cougars throughout my life, and they've made a lot of weird noises. But that second one, I just have a tough time accepting that noise as a cougar. In the defense of it being a cougar in heat though, the weather has been absurdly strange and very warm. Usually it's about negative 15 this time of year, but it's setting at around zero these past few weeks. This could cause some animals, including cougars, thinking it's spring conducting to some weird behavior. Government lab? I have to unfortunately say that this is most likely not the case. I've explored a lot of the mountain, as trails in my back 40 go onto crown land and up to the rest of the mountain. It's just logging and trails up there. My area is very boring. And you would notice any type of suspicious vehicles coming in and around here. Unless they're sneakily driving around mid-2000s rusted out F-150s. Because that's about three quarters of the vehicles out here, myself included. I would really like to believe that it was some crazy one-off wild animal sound that was just freakishly close to my trailer. But a lot of these Bigfoot theories are very similar to what I experienced. I don't want to even think of the skin crawlers some of you are mentioning. Last night was okay. There was no noises and dogs stayed calm all night. Let me tell you though, I fell asleep with the podcast playing just to distract myself from the quiet. I'll keep everyone updated if I have another experience or encounter out here. Thanks everybody. In the late 90s, when I was about 12 years old, I went to a summer camp at Robber's Cave in Oklahoma. Our cabin was filled with bunk beds and a big open space. I had a top bunk. One of the nights I was there, I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a sound outside of the window. My head lay opposite from the window so that when I sat up, I was staring directly outside into the woods. Through the glass, I saw a glowing green object in the shape of a person. I couldn't see a face but I could feel it staring at me. The ordeal lasted for what seemed like a minute of us staring at one another. I remember I began to feel sick to my stomach, and the next thing I remember is waking up the next morning. I've tried looking at this as rationally as I can, so I figure now maybe it was a dream I confused with reality or something, but it felt and still feels so real to me. The experience was so jarring I've had recurring dreams about this green glow ever since. But that first time felt so real. Anyone else experience anything like this? I'll keep this short and sweet. A few years back, we were having a brutally cold winter. The snow had frozen into ice and covered everything. It was pitch black in the backyard when I went to let my dog outside one last time before bed that evening. As we exited the house from the sliding door of the walkout basement and onto the lower deck, I felt that something was off. Our house backs up to some woods, so I was accustomed to hearing noises from wildlife in the night. This night was different. Nothing made a sound except the arctic cold wind, but I had the feeling I was being watched. 
The entire time, my dog was in the backyard. I looked around nervously, expecting to see a coyote or other predator to pop out of the tree line. My dog did his business, but afterwards stopped and stared at a corner of the woods until I got creeped out and called him back inside. I quickly locked the sliding door and shut the curtains, unable to shake the uneasy feeling I had outside. After double and triple checking all the locks in the house, I went to bed. Around three in the morning, I hear the muffled sound of my dog barking from the basement two floors below. I got up, stumbled down three flights of stairs and found him standing at the basement sliding door. He was peeking his head through the closed curtains, barking his head off with the hair standing up all along his back. I tried calling him away from the door, but he wouldn't let up. I dreaded peeking out the curtain to see what he was barking at after the uneasy feeling I had earlier in the night. Finally, I held my breath and swiped the curtain aside. I peered into the inky blackness but saw nothing to cause any alarm. A wave of relief washed over me. I figured it must have been a deer or raccoon in the yard that set him off. He whined at the door for a few more minutes until I bribed him upstairs with a dog cookie. I went back to bed and wasn't disturbed again. That is, until the morning when I went to the basement to let out the dog. I opened the sliding door and walked out onto the deck as he bounded into the snow. My blood ran as cold as the sub-zero morning temperatures when I looked down. There, frozen into the ice on the deck, was a set of bare human footprints. They were very clear. I could make out each toe on the person's foot. The prints were large and appeared to be from an adult male. Looking around, I noticed they started at the base of the deck, went to the sliding door and the window of the basement living room, then seemed to disappear off the side of the deck. I had my snow boots on, so I walked around the yard, but I could find no trace of the footprints in the snow once they left the deck. Keep in mind, the daily temperatures that winter barely made it over zero degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind chill made it feel close to 20 below. Frostbite would set in within a matter of minutes for anyone walking around barefoot, especially in the dead of night. I never experienced anything like that again, but I did adopt a second dog shortly thereafter. This was about 10 years ago with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. His mom is a big time hiker and was part of a hiking club that got awesome discounts on these very rustic cabins run by the state park. We decided to spend a weekend at one of them. The hike wasn't super far, probably a mile or so. The cabin was very bare bones. It had a deck off the back, so we were hanging out back there when we heard it. To this day, it was the strangest thing and so hard to describe. The sound was that of someone dropping something like a basketball. Thumps that progressively became closer and closer together, like when a ball gets closer and closer to the ground. The weirdest part was the sense of vibration that seemed to come from below us and or inside us. The first time it happened, we were weirded out, but I thought maybe there was something underneath the deck or the house, like a boiler or furnace, even though there was no heat. That was being weird, so we went down to check it out, and there was nothing. And then it happened again a couple more times, and we got so scared we ran back inside and considered leaving. No one we've ever talked to has described something similar. Truly, one of the weirdest things I've ever encountered. So I had convinced this girl that I knew to go on a random camping trip outside of Castle Rock, Colorado. Like many places in Colorado, you can usually kind of drive up into the mountains and eventually find a spot off of a 4x4 trail. That's not what I would call glamping or, for that matter, even reserved. Depending on how crazy you want, a 4x4 depends on how isolated you'll be. This was unfamiliar territory for me, so the plan ended up putting us in an area that wasn't exactly tame but it also wasn't like sleeping in your truck at 13,000 feet and hearing weird noises like drums. That's another story. Anyways, 
we're not really around anyone. Or at least when we set up, I didn't think we were. So Rachel and I set up camp, let our hair down and had a few drinks. Maybe no more than a few, because she starts talking like she's in a Shakespearean play. Anyways, it starts getting late and our phones are on dead. But I was able to recall that this honking probably started at around 10 and maybe even stopped around 2.30 or 3. I slept in my tent, and she slept in the back of the truck, despite my almost being seduced back there with her. How it started was basically random honking. It's hard to gauge sometimes how far away things are in the mountains. It can be because sound can travel so far. That being said, the honking was definitely not an alarm. The second curiosity was that it seemingly spaced out in a time frame that seemed random. At first, my mind was like, hmm. Then it was, okay, this is BS. Then it was concern. Maybe this person is in danger. Are they dying and need assistance? Maybe a bear. But ultimately, what if this is some sort of serial killer? And do I really want to go driving around at three in the morning trying to figure out the answer? No, I didn't. I'm a 22-year-old female, and this happened when I was in elementary school. I want to say I was like nine years old. My parents took me and my younger sister camping all the time in California. My mom admits that her placement of my sister and I in this tent is really messed up. If she could go back and change it, she would. The tent was set up with a space for two people in the middle. Think a square with two rectangles on the side with a divider that splits up the rectangles on the side. So like, privacy for my sister and I. But like someone could rip the tent on my side in the night and snatch me and they wouldn't be able to see because of the divider. Anyway, hopefully I painted a decent enough picture. I'm positioned to where my left is my parents sleeping and to the right was the wilderness. I still remember the setup of this campsite and you could see the campsites next to you but they were distantly spaced. Anywho, I wake up and I'm cuddling what I think is my mama's arm. I can feel the warmth through the tent as the divider would block me from actually touching her hand. I'm waking up out of the haze of just opening my eyes when I realize I'm facing the right direction. I remember silently freaking out and for some reason my kid brain instead of flinching, I thought to move my hand around what I felt to confirm I'm feeling something. I didn't wake my parents up. I just laid there really scared and I eventually passed out again. And I must have not made a big fuss about it back then because I did tell my mom and I think she kind of brushed it off as you were dreaming. But as time grew on, that memory stays to be one of my most vivid memories. I have, in my opinion, a really amazing memory when it comes to my past. I can remember being in a stroller and I can remember my thoughts too at that age really clearly. It could have been so many things, I do not even like to think of all of the possibilities. So I was on a kick where I wanted to go find the source of Tom's baby, a five pound nugget. This trip basically took me to the back side of Breckenridge. In fact, Breck was fairly close, but to get to it, there was a road called Road 10 because it's 10 out of 10 on the 4x4 hardness scale. I end up on top of this mountain and run into some Euro dudes in KJ5s, and they warned me not to go any further. On the mountain, there is an old cabin or maybe mining operation, but it's probably 150 years old. I try going further down the road, but I get sketched out, hike down to another super old cabin, and decide to spend the night on a slope in between two areas, thinking I can make a day out of this area the next day. The German dudes were the only people I had seen in 24 hours. As I'm starting to fall asleep in the back of my truck, I hear this rhythmic sound. Someone told me that perhaps it was a pressure difference in my gas system. Either way, every time I was just about to fall asleep it would happen. I had some really bizarre dreams, 
and had a paranoid feeling about a presence in the area. The main thing was just how alone I was, probably put me on edge more than normal. But the sound was real. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope you enjoy the extra rain at the end. I hope you all sleep very well. Good night, everybody.